Well, you've no doubt heard this story before. And we jumped around a little bit, so you kind of get the gist of it. But what do, you, what do you think of? What do you get stuck on? What do you wonder about when you hear this story of a flood and Noah and an ark? What it was like to clean up all the dead bodies. After exactly. Who cleaned up after him? Yeah, yeah. What other questions? <coughs> Where did the fish go? Where did the fish go? A lot of water. Yeah, did they, did they go in the ark? Did they, did they multiply? Well, Might have been good for the fish. Right, right. I don't know. Fish or flesh? I don't know. Did they count? How did the kangaroos from Australia get there? Man, you guys are taking all my jokes already. Yes, how did the kangaroos get there? Didn't make sense. I don't know. They hopped. They hopped? No. What about the unicorns? <laughs> we lost them. We lost them in the flood, didn't we? Yeah? What else? It's a weird story, isn't it? It is weird. Well, grace and peace to you from God, our Father in heaven and our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah, faith is weird sometimes. The stories that we read, the things we do, it's weird. But you know how I feel about that. Keep church weird, people. <laughs> I'm into it. But, but by faith, think about it. By faith, we hold out hope for things that we cannot see. Things that might seem strange. We expect miraculous healings, for example. And sometimes they actually happen. We pray for rain. Rain comes, eventually. And we interpret the events of our lives and of the world through this lens that might seem impractical to others, might seem strange. And we pray for those in the paths of storms and for the specific creatures of the natural world. There was a prayer petition not long ago for the uh, duck-billed platypus a couple of years back for no particular reason than someone thought, well, we ought to pray for them. And I, it's not a bad idea, but, but it is weird. It's a weird animal. It's real, by the way. In case you thought that was mytholo mythological, like a unicorn, they, uh, they're real. They have a face of a duck and, and the body of a beaver. And uh, they live in Australia. That's also a real place. We didn't make it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some strange animals. It's almost irrational. Uh, faith or some version of it we know can cause people to act irrational at times. Can cause people to condemn others to, or to create change. To start wars or stir creativity. To burn books or build homes. We think about early Christian communities. People thought they were weird too. It's not just you. They were accused of being cannibals. Because what did they do? Well, they got together every week and they invited their followers to come and worship this Savior who told them to eat his flesh and drink his blood. It's not Halloween yet, people. I know Alfie's got his decorations out already. But it's weird, right? Well, this story of Noah's Ark, I think, is a weird story, even though it is one of the most popular in children's Bibles. Nursery walls and rainbows and arcs, they all kind of go together, right? All, you probably all have a baby blanket with Noah's Ark on it. We decorate our Sunday school classrooms with this stuff all around the world. That seems kind of weird too, maybe. Because what's this story about? What do we hear first of all that this God decided to bring an end to all flesh? And maybe that's a question you think of when you hear this story. What kind of God would flood the whole creation and destroy what had just been declared very good. Wow, it didn't take long for that to go downhill. It's not very comforting. Do we take this story literally? My favorite, one of my favorite uh, theologians, <coughs> resident of the Grand Canyon City, Mark Allen Powell, says we take the literal stuff literally and we read the figurative stuff figuratively. And really, how could this possibly happen? I mean, Sure, there maybe were floods around the world and maybe there was some kind of big flood in the area at some point. When we lean deeper into the story, we have only more questions. Yes, how did the kangaroos swim from Australia to the Middle East? They can swim. I don't know if that, maybe not that far. Did the fish survive the flood? And who had to clean up the mess after the waters receded? We don't know. This is a problem with literalism. Maybe there was a flood. Other ancient belief systems included stories of floods too. 
in their, in their sacred stories. They also had vengeful gods whose wrath was executed on the people. Well, but what does this particular version of the story begin to reveal to us about the kind of God we proclaim and worship in this place? Well, the text tells us that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth. And the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. Oh, really? Mm. I don't find that part very hard to believe. We might imagine it was a lawless land like Game of Thrones or the Wild West or worse, but we don't need those gruesome fantasies to, to remind us of, of the violence that exists in the world, to remind us of evil. This weekend, we remember the loss of thousands of lives in a terrorist attack in New York, Pennsylvania, Washington, D.C. We know the violence that people do to each other. It's mine this time. Don't worry, Pastor Matt. Yeah. Yeah. We know the violence that people do to each other. We see it all the time. And there were preachers, of course, then and now, who tried to blame this stuff, this destruction on all Muslims and, and people who look like them or ones who, whose religion had been co-opted by fundamentalism, not simply violent creatures who used religion for their own purposes. And the unity we felt in the morning of those days and weeks was quickly divided by politics and fear. And after 21 years of wars in the Middle East, we struggle to see how we've made any progress toward mending those divisions in our world. It seems beyond our reach. But the good news in this story that I think we hear right away is that Noah was a good man. Noah was faithful. Noah walked with God. And that's a particular way of talking about someone who's faithful. It was Enoch, Noah's great-great-grandfather, who was said to walk with God. This means he prayed, he was faithful, he had fellowship and obedience that resulted in divine favor. We learn from the story that Noah is really no great hero, no warrior like in other ancient myths, but that he listened to the Lord. He obeyed. God spoke. God commanded him to build, and he built to the exact specifications given to him by the divine. He followed the plans. And the film version, Noah with Russell Crowe, you might know him, depicts the neighbors who looked at, at Noah and laughed or thought he was a fanatic or nuts, at least a little weird. But Noah was faithful. And maybe that's a reason we name our children after Noah, one who is faithful, one who walks with God. The floodwaters did rise, and for 40 days, we picture Noah and his family and all the animals on board doing what humans and animals do. And the next part of the story, you hear Noah opened a window. Yeah, it was a good idea. It was a good idea. Lots of reasons for it. But he opened the window to send out the raven and then the dove who brought back an olive branch. Anybody have an olive tree in their yard nearby? Yeah? Yeah. They're, they are, they can be a mess, yeah, for sure. Like us. Like us, right? Yeah. The dove brings back the, the olive leaf. And we start thinking about olive branch. Oh yes, well that's a sign of peace, isn't it? And I was doing a little research and, and I was today years old when I learned uh, the origin of the meaning of the olive branch as a symbol of peace. It goes back at least to the 5th century BC and we know the ancient Greeks uh, used them in the Olympics. And when there were Olympic Games, wars were suspended. And the victors in those contests were given a wreath of olive branches, right? Yeah, very cool. The olive wreath was worn by the winners also because olive trees take so long to bear fruit it could be said that someone who planted an olive tree must be expecting a long time of peaceful weather, peaceful living. They had faith that fruit would come. The olive branch was the visible sign of peace on earth for Noah and his family. They knew the flood was over and they would be saved. 
And this is a turning point in the story where the flood ends, the waters recede. Things are going to be different now. And this is where God's goodness is revealed. In other ancient cultures, punishment by the gods was a lesson, was given to the creatures who had not served them properly. You see, the creatures had to serve the gods, and if they didn't, bad things were going to be, happen, be happening. And if they did the right things, then they would be spared. Human beings lived in fear of what these capricious gods might want or do to cause pain, to cause bad weather, suffering for the people. But as the floodwaters recede, Noah's family and all the animals are saved, we go, wait a minute, this God is different. This isn't the story of a vengeful God or the threat of punishment for all who turn away and disobey. We can read it that way sometimes. But I think we see something more in this story. It's a story of what happens when human beings learn to trust that the one who made everything, all that is seen and unseen, loves us, wants better for us than the evil and violence that we bring about. God is working to fix the very brokenness in this story, not for the glory of the Divine One, as in other myths, but for me and for you. For all humanity, for all the creatures, for the Earth itself, this story is the revealing of a God who is unlike any other in the ancient world, who creates life and loves it, who serves life instead of the other way around, and will do whatever it takes to bring about the wholeness of the creation. See, God speaks again to Noah after the flood and makes a promise. One like God made to Abraham earlier in the story, a covenant making a deal that God would never again flood the entire earth. Never again would God destroy what God created, saying, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. It's a forever thing. It gets passed on and on and on. It's everlasting. And God's bow, unlike the one that humans use to commit war and violence. God's bow is a sign of peace and beauty. And when we see it, we have to stop and look and go, whoa, that's a double rainbow. Look at that. And it captures our imaginations. It excites us. It reminds us of peace. The storm is over. God is with us and God's promise is for us. God remembers and we remember. And we remember that we're not here for violence and destruction. We're not here to tear down, but to build up, to grow together, to build peace between me and you. Not to waste what we've been given, but to be for healing, for peace and life. We remember that we have a God who loves us enough to make that promise to never forsake us or the earth again, and even broke into our time and space to shed his own blood on the cross for us, to do what we could not do for ourselves. Jesus, the one whom even the wind and the seas obey, has died and risen for us, not, not just to forgive only us and make us the righteous ones while everyone else perishes, but to let that light that gets refracted into all the colors of the rainbow. Let that light of the world shine in us and through us and let Christ live in our lives. This is a story of renewal, not punishment. It's a story of the renewal of life and the renewal of all life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That this word of creation was given so that we would see and know that we are made in God's image that we are forgiven and loved and sent to forgive and to repair the damage between me and you and to share that word of forgiveness and promise and peace. In a world that insists on destruction and evil and violence, we get to be something else. God's kept the promise in Jesus and calls us to continue to share it with the world around us. 
So today, this special day that we remember 3,000 lives lost 21 years ago, the ones who have suffered ever since, we will give some time. We will serve together. We'll remember who we are as citizens, as neighbors, friends, and families. And we'll work because we are able and because our neighbors need what we have to give. But this is God's work, peace, life, renewal, and a promise for us forever. And our hands are tools to serve those neighbors that God has given to us today. We believe in the promise and we know that we are not forsaken, but have been forgiven, have been made alive in Jesus. We give thanks that God has done this for us and we get to carry that good news out into the streets and the parks and the apartment buildings and all the places we go today, but every day, every day, as we serve in every way that we can. So yeah, we'll be down at the park down the road and we'll clean up a little bit. We'll go to some apartment complexes and, and give them some paint and, and freshen up that place for our neighbors who live there. We'll honor our first responders and write letters to our elected officials. We'll enjoy our time together with our neighbors and Girl Scouts and city staff. It's a day to remember the promise, to remember who we are in light of God's love. Helpers, peacemakers, proclaimers of the promise given to Noah and given to us through the cross. God is here. You are not alone. You are loved. Amen.